y'all doing? Kind of laid back a little bit, right? Right, right, right. No problems getting in, right? No problems coming in, right? You guys pumped up? We're going to have sunshine all day long. Who's excited about that? Come on. All right, y'all stand up. Come on, let's make a little noise. Man, this is a great song. It's a brand new song for us. Just start singing along when you catch, catch on. It's called Shine a Light. Josh is going to lead us. Let's go. Come on. doing this morning? Most of you look pretty dry, so that's good. Well, we're excited that you're here this morning. No matter how gloomy of a week it's been or how dark of an hour we're in at the moment, we can always come in here and raise a hallelujah, amen? 
Let's do that right now. Let's sing these words together. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah. Come on. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a
How are you guys feeling this morning? You good? Well, you made it here. That's all that matters. And the sun is out. Yeah. What? So I'm very grateful that you guys decided to even be here when you could be out there enjoying the sunshine. But you know what? We're going to have a great time in here. We're going to celebrate together. We got Mark Beebe in the house this morning. Whoa, what? Let's pray real quick. God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for another day just to have breath in our lungs. And oh my goodness, the sunshine. God, we thank you so much for just another day to try at life again. Whether or not yesterday was awful, maybe the day before that was even worse. God, you gave us another chance just to show love and to show grace to others around us, just like you show us every day. God, I thank you so much that that mercy is new every single morning. We don't have to bring that baggage over from the day before. You set us free. God, I ask that you take over this room right now. Let your presence fill every heart and every mind. God, so that we can truly worship you in spirit and in truth. It's your name we pray. Amen. When you speak, darkness has to bow. Confusion has its final
In Micah 6.8, we read that we are called to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. One of the things I love about Cokesbury Church and this incredible church family is how willing you always are to respond to needs in our community, to make sure that the people around us always have what will make their lives the best possible so that everyone can thrive. But in that scripture, it calls us to do justice which is more than just loving the people around us. It's more than just meeting needs. That's going the extra step toward justice and advocacy so that we help solve the problems that are causing the needs to begin with. As a church, we are called to be working toward building God's kingdom in our city. And part of that is justice ministry. There's lots of ways to do that, but Justice Knox is one of the organizations working in our city to bring together people of different faiths, different backgrounds, different races, different socioeconomic statuses so that we can all work together toward building the kingdom that God desires. We'd love to tell you a little bit more about what that means to us. The thing that sort of struck our heart was that um, our son has had some struggles in school. We are able to um, give our kids what they need above and beyond to um, make those struggles um, not hurt so bad. And what if we weren't in this situation? What if we couldn't afford to have outside help? What if I was a single mom trying to raise two kids and couldn't give my son what he needed and therefore he behaved differently at school and we had been affected by some of the same things and had been given the grace and the um, opportunity that it was our opportunity to help others. Part of the strategy for a justice ministry is to involve more and more people to demonstrate to community leaders that God's people are willing to come together to get behind a cause that we believe God is behind, and that is helping you know, the least and the last and the lost. You know, there's real satisfaction in working together and getting beyond messiness and, and understanding a, an issue and finding a place where we can actually make, make some progress. We live in a complicated world with a lot of complicated problems, and there's no one way to solve the issues that our community is facing. But I do know that if we work together as a church and we work with people from all over our city, we can work toward God's vision for a community where all people can thrive and live together pursuing God's love for our town. We would love for you to learn more about Justice Knox with us. We would love for you guys to get involved with Justice Knox, and today you have an opportunity to do just that. If you'll stop by guest services on your way out, or if you're watching online, we'll post that link there as well. Right now, we are going to let our kids head to a space designed just for them where they can learn about Jesus in a way that's powerful for them. So we've got this whole color-coded thing going on. This is pretty straightforward for me, at least. Uh, they had to teach it to me, but white light back there, that door, green light up here. That gets your third and fourth graders, your K through two. It's really, really great. We're going to continue to worship this morning as we give back to God just a portion of what he has given us this week. Uh, we're going to take an offering. It's really powerful what God can do in us when we just let go a little bit and buy into what God is doing in our community and in our church. Will you guys join me in prayer? God, thank you for waking us up this morning, for putting breath in our lungs, for giving us a new day, a new opportunity to serve you. Father, we just pray that um, you would take these gifts and these offerings, that you would use them to help other people, to help more people meet your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Man, this is a great song this morning, and it's just perfect for the message. And Mark, I just want to tell you, we picked this song before we knew about the rain. This is a great Avril Lavigne song. This is called Head Above Water. <laughs> well, at least we got a laugh. Gotta keep the calm before the storm I don't want less, I don't want more Must bar the windows and the doors 
Everybody good? You survived the rain? I guess that's what we call that, right? So it's good to have you this morning. I'm really glad that uh, you're here. If this is your first time here, thanks for coming. Hope you'll um, come back. And uh, if you have questions about what God is doing here at Cokesbury, feel free to ask them. We'll be out at, we'll have people out at um, guest services right out this way, and we'd love to talk to you about that and answer any questions that you might have. We um, also want to welcome people that are joining us online. Say hello to these guys, hello to these guys if you would. So uh, Thursday, I was trying to like put this thing like right up here. You know how like it makes me feel like one of those runways when you go to a concert and they like wipe right out in the middle of you. But then I was told like if you step out this far with it, the lights make you look like in you're in the, you're like you're in the dark. So for some of you guys, that's a good thing. So I guess I'll move it back here. But it's in protest, amen. So maybe we'll figure out what to do with that. But I'm just glad that uh, I'm glad that we had the last series here on Unchained that we had. I thought it was um, an important series for a lot of people that um, that were a part of a part of those weeks. And if you haven't seen that series, we really want to ask you to think about going back and watching those weeks. Um, I know that they're going to be helpful, and we're going to kind of continue. Um, with some of that conversation today in what we're going to do with this new series. It's two weeks on John, chapter John 1, 2, and 3, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And um, Anna's going to pick it up next week. And you're going to see the connections that we're going to get into this morning with what we were talking about with the Unchained series and what we're talking about today. So um, these letters, periodically we teach one of the letters that are in the second half of the Bible in the New Testament. Letters were written to churches that had developed to a point that they started to have challenges. Paul, on this guy Paul, writes a lot of letters to a lot of churches, but not all of them. But they're um, written to local churches. So you can imagine someone writing a letter to Cokesbury saying, this is the stuff I want you to deal with. I'm going to talk about these John letters here in a second, but that's what they are, and um, that's what we're going to get into today. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, we want to pray today that you, um, you come on in and get into areas of our life where we probably think today, God, that you don't have any business. And we pray, God, that you teach us today that you always have business in every part of our lives. And we want to pray that you send your Holy Spirit here this morning. And God, that you come into those places in our lives where we didn't think you would ever be. And you say things to us that we weren't ever sure you would say. Because we need to hear them. So in your sweet name we pray, amen. So these John 1, John 2, John 3 letters, they're being written to a church in a place called Ephesus. And they're being written to these churches that have developed to the point that they are now in the middle of, for lack of a better way to put it, um, false teaching. So these these churches are struggling with varieties of viewpoints about stuff, and they are struggling. And so John, this guy John, is writing them saying, I want us to get back to the core teaching of Jesus together. And I'm going to write this letter so in three parts, so that's what we're going to do together. And, and that's, that's what these letters are always, these correctives. Same guy that probably wrote um, John 1, 2, and 3, which we're going to be into, also wrote the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. It's coming about, um, I don't know, it's coming between 50 and 60 years after uh, Jesus had um, done what he was going to do with uh his followers, this guy that wrote this was, was a, probably a, a follower of Jesus, probably a disciple. So he was with Jesus and with everything that happened to Jesus, and he was a part of how the church started to develop, and he wants to talk about the stuff we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to do this, just get right into it. This, he says, is the message we heard from Jesus And now the message that we declare to you. Here's what I want you to know, he's saying. It's like, you know, in um, in a paragraph, you know, you have a paragraph. If you write a paragraph, you have a theme sentence, right? You have a theme statement. If you're in the middle of taking, if you're in college right now, and you're in an English class, 
or you're in high school, your teacher is bugging you about what is the thesis statement, what is the theme statement, what is the core, what are you trying to get people to know, and you don't like it because you think you're a great writer. And she's like, nobody knows what you're trying to say. This is that. This is the thesis statement. God is light, and there is no darkness in God at all. First John one five, and he goes on, verse seven. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with each other. God has fellowship with us. We have fellowship with God. And here's the part. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin or all brokenness. 1 John 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one that you've heard from the very beginning. This old commandment, thesis, to love one another is the same message you've heard before. Yet it's also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light, and here's the word I want to get into, the true light is already shining, 1 John chapter 2. So my question is this, do you have confidence in the already? And you're like, well, what is the already? Well, the already is this. Most people, whether they're Christian or not, know something about, um, they would know something about Holy Week, right? They would know that something's happening during Holy Week. Um, they might not know much about, like, you know, Palm Sunday. Um, if you're a Lutheran, of course, you know all about all this hot shot stuff, but, you know, there's, they might not know a lot about that, but they definitely, people definitely know about Good Friday. At least, I mean, maybe if you're not even a Christian, you know, yeah, at least I get half a day off. That's good. You know, but there you are, and you know you know something about Good Friday. You know, on Good Friday, there was something that happened with Jesus. Jesus died on a cross, or that's what Christians say. That's what they believe, right? And, that, and, and something important happened on Good Friday. But what people don't know is what happened on Saturday. And here's what happened on Saturday. And this is why... The darkness has already been overcome. This is why my question is, do you have confidence? Are you living in the already? Because on Saturday, here's what happened. On Saturday, Jesus went and had a battle with the enemy in hell. And he went there and defeated the enemy in every way. And left there with no doubt that he was king. And he left there with no doubt that he was king because of me and because of you. And what he's saying to you this morning is, I want you to understand, because of the cross and because of that battle in hell and because of the resurrection and because of what has already been accomplished and because I'm the king, I am also the king over every single part of your life. Parts of your life that are working well for you and parts that are not. Parts where you feel you're succeeding and parts where you don't feel like you're succeeding. Parts that you feel are going good and parts that you don't feel are going good at all. Stuff that is exciting you, stuff that is unnerving you, stuff that you believe you have accomplished and stuff you feel like you're 10 million miles away from. Stuff where you can have hope and, and stuff in your life where you feel hopeless. Every bit of that is what was defeated in hell. Every bit of that is what it means to say that Jesus is king. Because if I go to you, you know, if you're a Christian, I go, well, do you think Jesus is king? Well, you know you're supposed to say yes, right? So you go, well, yeah. I'm like, well, say no. Let's get down to it. Is he the king of what is going to happen in your life this Wednesday afternoon? And you're like, I don't know, man. I mean, I do church on Sunday. What are we What are we having this Wednesday afternoon conversation for? Because I want to know, is he the king of what's going to happen on Wednesday? If on Wednesday your boss comes up and you says, "We're moving our whole company to um to the Philippines and you're not, you know, we're not taking anybody with us and you're out of a job 
And on where on Wednesday, someone tells you that you have this sickness going on in your body, or on Wednesday, someone tells you somebody else has it, that you love is sick, or on Wednesday, you're in the middle of a relationship situation, and it's way worse than you thought, and he said something you never thought he would say. Is Jesus king? Do you have confidence in the already, in what Jesus has already done for you? Because if it is true that he became the king, which is what this keeps most people away from God, if we do not believe that God only wants good for us, that God loves us unconditionally, only seeks the best for us, would never hurt us, would never attempt to harm us, and despite what the circumstance is that we're in the middle of looking at, we need to realize that God would only want the best for us, amen? If that isn't something that you can get with, then you're going to have a problem with this already being this powerful and having confidence in what Jesus has already done for you. It's a completely different way, right, of approaching life. Because I start off today and I go, man, I don't know what's going to happen to me today. Could be really good. Could be really not good. But at the end of the day, I know that Jesus, the king, my king, has already defeated what I think temporarily may be defeating me. Do you follow that? It's important. And what is happening in this church is that viewpoint of the gospel is being challenged. And we're going to get into that. He says, so we're lying. Here's the opposite now. So we're lying if we say that we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth, 1 John 1, 7. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a fellow believer, and he's picking this experience of hate, and I'll tell you why in a minute, hates a fellow believer who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person doesn't know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. See, here's the thing. Either it's true this morning that you have confidence in the already of Jesus being the king in your life, in the already of Jesus having defeated everything that happened to you, is happening to you, or will happen to you, regardless of the way that the circumstances currently, currently appear, or you have shifted to something else, and the something else is you're living in a place where the determination shows up with the enemy, and the enemy is determined even though he has been defeated to have a piece in your life of what I'm going to call this morning competitive ownership. I want you to get it like this. A lot of you guys have kids in your family that play soccer, right? And if you coach, if you ever coach soccer, the, the fate worse than death is you coach a game and the game goes to a tie. Like I used to try to coach soccer when the girls were older. I didn't know jack about soccer. I mean, I would sit there and they, the referee would tell you all these exotic rules. And I'm like, I don't even hardly know what kids play what position yet. Don't, don't tell me all the rules. I mean, I would, I would teach kids to play soccer the way I knew how to play football. Imagine this. If you're a soccer player, soccer coach, there was a lot of yellow on the field for a while. You get me? Until I figured it out, there was a lot of yellow. And I'd be sitting there going, what is that? They were just going for the ball. Ooh. They're like, I know, Mark. I mean, you can't put your elbow up there and shove that kid to get the ball. It's like, well, what kind of game is this? This isn't a good game. I, mean, I didn't say that to the ref, but listen, for about a year, I thought it. And here you are, and you play your heart out. And there are these kids that, I mean, they got bigger, but when I first started, they were like little, play their heart out, and they play to a 1-1 tie. 
I hate ties in competitive sports, amen? And what I hate more than that, like I personally hate the college system of overtime. I hate the current NFL system even more. But what I really hate is the stupid soccer deal of the, the kicks. And you stand there and you play all this time and it comes down to some creepy little kid on the other team randomly kicking a ball in one-on-one -on -one with your goalie? Come on! I think they should have to run like three miles and then see who can do it. Something. But see, it's kind of like this. That game that I'm talking about, imagine it was already won. Not just tied, but already won. And now the enemy comes along in your life and goes, well, I know Jesus already won you, Mark. I mean, I know that, I know he already won your heart. I know that he already defeated me. He has, here's the important part of this conversation. He has no hold on you. He has no ownership of you. He's only going to have a hold on you or ownership of you if you, Mark, are you following me? If you, Mark, give it to him. You have to give him these pieces of your life that he's going to control. He's not going to be able to take it. You have to give it to him. Because this game's already over. But the enemy goes, oh, no, like, I don't want the game to be over. I mean, I see the score, but it doesn't count. We're going to have penalty kicks. Or we're going to have, you know, we're going to have overtime kicks. The enemy's belief is that even though he was fully defeated by Jesus in hell, on that Saturday, it doesn't matter. He's going to continue to try to take and compete for ownership in your life. And the way he's going to do it is introduce darkness. What's darkness? Well, there are a lot of ways to look at it. Have you ever had a stretch of time? Have you ever had two days, three days, six weeks, six months, where it seemed like in your life every single thing was sideways? Your relationships were bad. Your attitude was sideways. You felt out of sort with your the people in your life. You felt like you were a million miles away from your children or your husband or somebody at work. Everybody said something to you. It agitated you. Things just weren't going right. And if I said to you, does it feel kind of like it's dark? You might say yes. That's a piece of darkness. Darkness is hopelessness. Darkness is feeling significantly, if you're a Christian, is feeling significantly estranged from God. If you're not a Christian, darkness is the belief that I've got to make all the decisions and do all the work and create all the stuff to take care of myself and be safe by myself because this is a bad way to live. I'm the only person that I can trust. And I've met a lot of people that are even in deeper pain than that when they get to this place of going, you know what, I realize now in what's happening to me, things are so dark that I don't even trust myself. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Where you do not, for whatever reason, you get to a place where you do not trust your own emotions, your own thoughts, your own feelings, or your own direction. That's darkness. And there's even more to it than that. I want to talk about this lovely feature that he's drilling on as his example today. Resentments. Now, resentment, I mean, resentments start off in almost every case in a pretty innocent way. And at, at 10 o'clock, I introduced people to um, somebody named Heather. So we'll use Heather today. If your name is Heather, you are not being picked on. It's really okay. Um, Jesus still has complete victory over your life. I'm telling you that right now. It's just a random name. And if you want to change your name, we got the baptismal font up here. We can rebaptize you and change your name right here. We're not going to do any of that. I'm lying. I'm just, you know, if you're Heather, you'll be okay. So you got Heather. And Heather is your sister. And yesterday, it confirmed to you that Heather is the favorite in your family. Because once again, Heather got to pick what movie your family went to. And you thought the movie was a horrible movie, a wretched movie. You didn't ever want to go to that movie. It was the worst movie there could possibly be. You had to go with your family because Heather picked the movie. And it seems like, as a matter of fact, every time your family goes out to eat, guess who picks where we're going to go? Heather. Guess who gets to open up her Christmas presents ahead of everybody else? Heather. Guess who got the biggest presents this year? Heather. 
Guess who mom went out and bought the most clothes for? Heather. Heather is the favorite. You have this, right? I mean, you, you see it at... You feel that way about somebody at work. You feel that way about somebody in your family. It might not be a sibling. You know, it might be, it could be a lot of people. You can. You might go with your spouse and you go to your spouse's family event. And they just, they think your spouse hung the moon, but they think you're just kind of slightly above average. And you endure three days of that. Resentments come from what seem to be innocent places. We go with Heather, so that continues to build. And now, Heather starts to represent all the other people in your life that don't seem to be able to treat you well or seem to be able to get over on you. And it builds. And this thing about Heather, man, I think about her a lot. I think about the Heather factor a lot. And, like, it's causing me a bunch of problems emotionally. It makes me feel uncared for. It makes me feel underappreciated, undernoticed, underaccepted, under a million things, but I keep it up with Heather. And now I am giving Heather rent in my head, a lot of free rent in my head. A lot. I'm giving her a lot of space in my head because Heather, I just cannot get enough of how much I resent her or whoever, right? Somewhere along the way, we're not supposed to, I mean, John's the one that said it, but I mean, like, we're not really supposed to talk like this in church, right? But somewhere along the way, this idea comes into my head and sort of starts moving even into my heart, and it kind of goes like this, you know, I, I'm never, I mean, I'm, I'm never, I'm never going to be able to, to win, win over Heather. You do what I wish? Maybe just saying this to myself. I mean, I, I wish Heather was dead. I mean, I hate her. Like when you say, when you say you hate somebody, you're actually saying, I wish they were dead. And like the darkness he's talking about is darkness because where it takes you to when you go, I wish she was dead, which is what unresolved resentments do. Sooner or later, I'm telling you, they will take you there. And the person that's paying the price is you. Heather's like walking around going to her next favorite movie, having sushi or whatever she's having, all the stuff you hate. She's having like, she's having like, I don't know what she's having, all the stuff that she's having quinoa tonight, for God's sakes. That's Heather. She doesn't care what you think. And she's got all this space in your head. And if it's not a, a person, it's something in your life that you're resenting. And that resentment takes you to that hate. I wish they were dead. I wish this wouldn't happen. And now what John is saying is you are now, congratulations, you have now arrived at playing the role of God. And that's where the darkness is. Because you don't want to believe anymore that Jesus is the king over every space in your life, including your head, including what you've given up to Heather. You only want him in some space and everything else. What John's saying is that's darkness. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about this experience of hate? What are you going to do to let light? What do you do to let light into your darkness? Well, you realize, number one, that you're going to have to have assistance. You know, the most dangerous talking that we do in our lives, I honestly believe this, isn't what we say to other people, it's what we say to ourselves. Self-talk is a killer. Self, like, like I wish people, I wish everybody on the planet would realize self-talk will never be good for you. You got to check stuff out with other people. You got to check stuff out with people that have more experience than you do. People that you trust. You know, everybody's got to have one one person in your life that you'll say anything to. I mean, it'd be nice if it was your spouse because your marriage would really grow if you had that kind of intimacy where you were going to say anything, share anything, any level of fear or whatever. Any level of, quote, darkness, that'd be good. But maybe it's not your spouse. Maybe it's your friend. But you need one. You need one person where you're going to do that. It's like I know a lot of people that are entrepreneurs. 
develop very large companies, spend a lot of money, theirs or somebody else's. You know the one feature about entrepreneurs that is always true? They are more than willing to talk about their fear of failure. Isn't that true? They're more than willing to talk about, oh, God, this could really go sideways. They have learned that they need assistance. It's kind of like, it's kind of like going to church. I mean, like, people sit around and debate whether they should go to church today. It's like, man, I don't know. Is it going to be good? I mean, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Here's my new thing. Let me show you. Here's what you got to do to decide if you should go to church. You ready? Get in your car every Sunday. Drive to where there's 8 million of them. Drive to where there's a Chick-fil-A. Now, if you drive to where there's a Chick-fil-A, that sucker's closed on Sunday. That is screaming at you. We think you should go to church. So, like, if you're debating whether you should go to church next Sunday, get your butt up, get in your car, drive to a Chick-fil-A, closed. You're supposed to be at church. That's their point. That's why they close on Sunday. Like, everything about church isn't right. People always go, man, I just don't know. I don't know if church is a good thing for me. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure that those people, I'm not sure that people at church, Mark, are genuine. I'm like, here, I'll stop that for you. They're not. <laughs> They're more jacked up than you are, man. They're not. Well, I just don't know. I mean, I, those people, I don't know that they really live what they say. They don't. In the establishment of a beachhead of light. Here's another piece that's important. Do not love this, do not love this world nor the things it offers for you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for the physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Bringing the light in your life means focusing on stuff that is timeless. Like, first of all, if, if you went to the church, and maybe you've been there, if you went to the church in Jamaica, or you went to the church in the Caribbean somewhere, or you went to Africa or Asia, this conversation is probably making some of us uncomfortable about the enemy and darkness and another power in this world that competes with God and all that. Like, you're like, God, this really makes me upset. I really wish you wouldn't talk about this. If you were in Africa or someplace like that, this would be a common conversation. They're fully aware of this. They're fully aware of this darkness, the danger of living in darkness. Talk about it all the time. Talk about the kingship of Jesus all the time. Fully alert, fully aware. You see, we don't, we're like, makes us uptight. Fully aware of talking about what do I need to focus on that's going to be eternal and timeless. What is God trying to show me that I can do with my life that's going to lay out into other people? What's timeless? The question today takes me back all the way to the beginning. Do you believe, do you have confidence in what Jesus has already done in your life? And are you living on that or are you living on your circumstances? Which is it? Are you allowing darkness to do more than creep in but to take over significant areas of your life because you're questioning the already of what Jesus has done? You're questioning his kingship with this relationship in your life. You're questioning it with your money. You're questioning it with your job, whatever. What in your life this morning needs to come to the light? I want to ask you to do it this way. We're going to sing our last song and finish up worship this morning, and I want to ask this question. God, will you light up blank? in my life. What is in the blank? Like you can talk you can talk to God about it up here in front. You can talk to somebody in the care room about it. But listen, don't leave don't leave this building without asking that of God. There is this dark place in my life, God, will you light this up? And once you're open to that, you'll see 8,000 resources that are become available to you that are going to light up that dark place that you've been living with. It doesn't have to be dark. Jesus already has the win. The question is, are you going to live out of the win, or are you going to live out of the darkness? 
Thanks so much. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.